In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I begin with the greeting words of Paradise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And we want to extend special greetings and uh, hopes of peace and understanding to our non-Muslim friends who are gathered here tonight, those who may be passing through the hallway, those who may look in the window, wherever you are, we also greet you um, with the greeting words of peace. It is so important for the people of America and the West to begin to understand the cultures of the world. And places such as the University of Miami represent a gathering point. It represents an area where students come from different parts of the planet, where people are able to share information, where now with advanced technology, we are able to access information from different parts of the planet and to bring it together, and where we are able to do investigations to try to find out that which is true and that which is false. Also, another one of the great uh, blessings of this technology is that we are able to sift through data and to find out that information that is causing confusion. And sometimes historical documentation or what has come to us as historical documentation is actually more based upon the opinion of the person who wrote the book as opposed to actual fact. Also, unfortunately, people are influenced by their religions, by the country they live in, or by their culture. And so with uh, the bringing together of information, we are able to look closer at primary documentation to try to understand what is the actual source of the phenomena. And then we can sift away the other opinions and the other bits of information that were brought together as though they were the actual fact. And so tonight we are looking at culture. We're looking at the culture of people in America and Canada and the Western countries and uh, how this affects people throughout the planet. And we want to do this uh, in the light of this concept of stereotyping. Because this concept of stereotyping has had a very, has, has had a very difficult or, or critical effect upon the cultures of the people who lived here in the Americas over 500 years ago or more, the native population, also African American people. People of all different nationalities have found themselves at one point and another being stereotyped. For some reason, based upon the changes going on in the international arena, politically and economically. For some reason, the Muslim world, Muslims today are being targeted. And even Hollywood itself is taking on a role, an aggressive role, uh, in dealing with the name Muslim or the name Islam. When I was growing up in America here, the bad guys were usually uh, Japanese, Germans and Russians in the 70s and the 80s. And of course, the native people, that's a given. They were always portrayed as being the bad guys in the movie. So the cowboys and the, and, and the military people had to rescue the free world from the danger. Today, we find that the bad guys usually are Spanish drug cartels, uh, Afro-American gangs, Jamaican posse. But today, the most sinister character that you could bring to the screen is the Arab terrorist. He seizes his hostages, and he will not release his hostages unless his comrades are released from the prison. And so then the forces of good, quote unquote good, go into action. And we've, we have found in the past few years, coming out of Hollywood, that even people like Chuck Norris in Delta Force, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the big muscles and 
Steven Seagal with a little ponytail uh, on his head, and all types of people are now uh, chasing this new uh, terrorist, this new phenomenon, this evil force, evil empire, seeking to destroy the world. Recently, unfortunately, we have heard of the coming of another movie called The Siege. And in this movie, which will be starring uh, Bruce Willis and Denzel Washington and others, it, it is portraying uh, germ warfare, chemical warfare in New York City. And so the FBI and the CIA and, and, and the, the American military are dispatched to try to deal with the new terror. They put the, their heads together. And unfortunately, the movie shows soldiers coming in, breaking into masjids, houses of worship of Muslims, and dragging out women with scarves on, taking people from, from their worship. And Muslims are being portrayed now as this dangerous international force. What is setting a new precedent in this case is that from what we understand, these Muslims are put into concentration camps in America. This is a very serious issue. For those who have understanding of World War II, understand that when the, the United States government declared war on the Japanese and the powers with Hitler, anybody who was from that nationality, who was considered to be a threat to the internal security of the country, could be put into jail. And Japanese Americans, Japanese Canadians, even though they, they may have been loyal to the government, were put into concentration camps. Also, those of us who lived during the 60s, when the rioting went on, when, when after Martin Luther King uh, had been killed and cities were being burned, also realized that there were concentrations set up for African Americans, that if the riots got out of control, there was a plan that has come forward now, and all of the nationalist organizations were broken apart, infiltrated, the leaders were killed and, and sent into exile. And there was a specific plot that if the African American population became too volatile and out of control, that they, uh, or at least the more uh, negative, volatile elements within their population could be put into concentration camps in America. So the fact that these concentration camps existed and the fact now that Bruce Willis, after, finish, after fighting against aliens and uh, 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 meteors and comets and fighting everybody and saving America, now wants to save America against the Muslims. This is the furthest thing from reality. Because the reality is, Muslims are not a tiny group of people trying to destroy the world. This is a complete stereotype. Muslims make up 23.1% of the Earth's population. This is not a tiny cult in the Middle East. This is an international phenomenon. There are over 60 million Muslims in China, over 70 million Muslims in the former Soviet states, millions of Muslims in uh, Europe. It is the majority religion on the African continent. And Islam is probably the fastest growing religion here in the Americas. There are millions of Muslims throughout the world. And for those who used to think that Islam was, was, was a racial religion, in the sense that it was the religion of Africa and Asia, we found out in the Chechen struggle that the Chechen people, the people of Chechnya, who resisted the Soviet government, are pure Caucasian people. They live on the foot of the Caucasoid Mountains. And so those ancient or those old outdated anthropological terminologies, how they used to ca uh, categorize us even here in the University of Miami, as being Negroid, Caucasoid, uh, Mongoloid, and so forth and so on. This is outdated. But still, if you, if you go by those terminologies, which don't really make sense, there are Muslims who are Caucasian people who led one of the strongest resistance to oppression of the 20th century. And so therefore, this is not a racial religion. This is not a cult-based religion. This is, in, this is an international phenomenon. And the most important aspect about being a Muslim is not uh, wearing certain clothing. It's not eating certain food or speaking any language in particular. 
Islam is the religion of Tawheed, which means the religion of the belief in one God. And we are taught that this belief in one God was shared by people throughout the planet from the beginning of time. And we are taught that the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace and blessings be upon him, was the seal of a long line of prophets and messengers who came to every nation and every tribe. In the Quran, the book of scripture of the Muslims, in Surah An Nahal, in verse 36, it tells us, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ رَسُولًا أَنْ اِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا التَّاغُوتِ And we have sent to every nation a messenger that they would worship Allah, they would worship the Creator, and they would stay away from false gods. And so we find that monotheism is not the property of any particular group, but it is the property of the whole of humanity. Those who have had the opportunity to travel have found that monotheism has been shared by people in all countries of all different languages. I had the opportunity to travel in many countries and I questioned the historians and those people who were keeping the culture, the local culture. And I found that even in China, the concept Shang Ti in Mandarin Chinese refers to the one God. That even the ancient Vedas within Hinduism, there is a belief in one God because Hinduism itself is not one particular belief. In that there is even monotheism in the early scriptures. In Africa, there were many different nations who had the belief in one God. One of the pharaohs of Egypt, Akhnaten, Akhnatun, whose wife was Nefertiti. You probably heard of her uh, before. They say she was the first woman to, to be wearing cosmetics. Um, this is in one of the ancient kingdoms uh, in Egypt itself. History tells us that Akhnaten um, was struggling against the, the, the myriad of gods, the variety of gods in ancient Egypt. And he spoke about the power of Atun, the power behind the sun. Not to worship Ra, the sun god but to worship the power behind the sun. In the Psalms of Akhnaten, there's very long Psalms, Psalms and one of the sections reads a, as follows. It's speaking about the Creator, and it says how legion or how varied are your works that are hidden from the face of men. O soul God, who is like no other, you made the earth according to your will, alone. Men, cattle, and all beasts, everything on earth that walks upon feet, everything that flies with its wings, foreign lands, Syria, Cush, and the land of Egypt. And you set every man in his place and supplied his needs. Everyone has his provisions and his allotted lifespan. Their tongues are diverse in speech and their appearance likewise. Their skins are different, for you have differentiated the peoples. This sounds very much like Surat al-Hujurat. This is like a, a chapter in the Quran, and you will find this in all the scriptures of monotheism. We are not sure that Akhnaten was a prophet, but we can see within his writings that Tawheed, that monotheism, was alive and well at that time in ancient Egypt. In other parts of Africa, you will find, like in the case of the sand people of southern Africa, who are sometimes called the Bushmen, the sand people are intensely sensitive to a governing life force, an invisible, all-present, omnipotent power beyond the comprehension of people. And to this force is attributed all creation and all manifestations of nature. The Akan people who live in Ghana, one of their sayings is, God is he who knows or sees all. This is one of their sayings. The Burundi people living in, in Burundi also have a strong belief in the one God. It is part of the Bantu or Entu cosmic concept that looks at all the cosmic forces emanating from one point. The Khosa people of South Southern Africa, they have a word Qamata. When they use Qamata, it means Allah or God is the greatest. 
And they use this concept in their religion and in many of their ceremonies. The Ashanti people say, no one shows a child the supreme being. In other words, the child knows naturally about the supreme being. And so you find that in these traditional religions, contrary to what is taught in many religion courses, in the traditional religions, if you go back to the root, you will find the concept of monotheism. Ancient Egypt is probably one of the best documented areas of, of, of the ancient kingdoms before um, uh, Christ. And you find that the further back you go, that the more the people were involved in Tawheed, in monotheism. Contrary to what is taught, what is taught in many religion courses is that people first worshiped material things, and then later on, Semitic people from the Middle East taught the belief in one God. And so the religions of monotheism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were developed, and then monotheism spread throughout the world. The Quran itself is, 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 is contradicting this concept. As it says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَتْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ And we have sent to every nation, not to the Semitic, not a Jinsa Asami, not to Semitic people only, but we have sent to every nation the belief in one God. In the Americas, there is a strong belief in one God. And we find the Cherokee Nation and the Wolf Clan in particular, whose oral traditions are still available to those who are able to access this, these traditions. Dr. Robert Crane, a former advisor to the President of the United States and a part Cherokee, was able to go to these oral traditions of the Wolf Clan. In it, he found that when they would begin traditionally their prayer, they would begin it by saying, Ya Allah. Now he was a Muslim, or he is a Muslim. And for many years, people used to think that this was maybe a Hebrew saying, a Semitic saying. It is Semitic, but it is Arabic. And the Cherokee people looked to the east. The Cherokee people recognized there were people coming across the ocean long before Columbus. They used to have dwellings in America with over 100,000 people, three-story buildings. We don't understand this about the Americas. We're stuck with stereotyping that gives us this concept of native people being savages who, who are only living in, uh, in huts and had no religion, had no concept, and needed to be civilized. This is part of the racist, uh, imperialistic type of, 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 of history that has been taught over the years, which brainwashes people into disrespecting this themselves and even to look at documentation and not be able to extract information from this documentation because their minds are so brainwashed and they're so paranoid. The reality is, is that the native people here in the Americas had strong cultures. They had philosophy, pyramids. And even within the, from the Americas itself, the concept of Tawheed, the concept of one God, was alive and well. And so it is our belief as Muslims, and many historians also take this, concept, this belief, that when you look at the religions from the beginning of time, we have to recognize that there was a constant struggle going on between those who believed in one God and those who believed in many gods. This struggle has always existed with human life. We find it more intense at different points in time. But what is important for us to understand is that in America today, we are sort of a hodgepodge, uh, melted down mixture of hundreds of cultures. And we call it American, or we call it Canadian. But nobody is really sure what it actually means. And now that we're going into the 21st century, it is important for us to be able to um, uh, separate the different elements within that culture and to recognize the roles that these elements play. In this struggle that went on from the early days of human life, there were people who put their worship in the natural world. And so those natural objects that were around them that appeared to be the strongest objects, 
they would worship through those objects. So in other words, if, if people living in desert areas, in many of these areas you find a huge rock or a huge tree. And so many people would worship the tree or the rock or, the, or they felt they would worship the cosmic forces through that tree or through that rock. In some countries that had large rivers, such as those who lived around the Nile in the Nile Valley, or in the Niger River, or the Congo River, or the Amazon, those who lived around these powerful forces of water, we find that religion was developed around the river. And in many cases, people would worship manifestations of the river even some of the animals from the river itself, hoping to appease the power and the forces in the river itself. Probably the most common form of worship in the ancient world was the worship of the sun. And that is for obvious reasons. The sun is obviously the largest of all of creation. And that when the sun comes out, the power of the sun, it gives light after darkness. It gives heat in the cold weather. It brings forth the, light, uh, the life from plants. And so the sun itself, in a sense, is a life-giving form. And so those who were trying to figure out what is the source of our life, what is the source of the living beings around us, focused on the sun as the main object and developed within their religions, a concept based upon the sun. And so we find this concept in all parts of the world. Contrary to some of the beliefs of people, it was even very strong in Europe. I mean, up until now, we still, count, we still have during our week, at the end of our week, we have Saturday and then we have Sunday, which is the day of the sun. And this is a concept that they used to have. And what is important for us to understand, especially when we're dealing with young people who, who, who tend to be caught up just in images coming at them, that the images within many of the holidays that we have have got a number of streams, and especially you could say two main streams that are coming in. There is a stream of monotheism, and there is a stream of polytheism, of those who worship many gods and those especially who focused on the sun god. In the winter season, around December 25th, the people celebrated uh, the winter solstice. And those of you who have lived in the north, I'm coming from Toronto, Canada. There's four seasons, not two or three like you have here. There's four seasons. And these four seasons in Canada are very distinct seasons, although El, El Nino and La Nina are changing that also. But they're very distinct seasons. And so within these seasons, there are certain high points or low points. And the solstice time is the time when you, the essence of the season comes about. And so the winter solstice would come about um, somewhere between um, December, in, in December, from December 21st, and it goes all the way to around January 6th or so. And so the people of the North would celebrate uh, different uh, holidays have different occasions based upon the winter solstice. Put yourself in the northern countries. I went to Norway and spent some time with the Muslims in Oslo. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. They're really far up north. And also I had the chance to go to Alaska and there's Muslims in Alaska. Now when we were there um, in the summertime and it was time for Salat al-Maghrib and we looked outside, and the sun was still out. Somebody looked at his watch and he said, well, that's sunset, and it's time to make Maghrib. So we made Salatul Maghrib that is normally made with the sunset according to the watch, and the sun was out. The time for Isha, they looked at their watch again. It's supposed to be darkness of night according to the fiqh. They looked at their watch and they said, it's time for Isha. We made Isha and the sun was out. Around one o'clock at night, I looked at my watch and realized it's time to go to bed, but the sun was out. And so in, in those parts of the world, you are in a situation where, for the Muslims, you make taqdeer. And the fuqaha have told us 
that you can use the closest reasonable uh, uh, city for your base, or you can use Mecca till Mukarramah. And some different uh, fuqaha have used different positions. Where I was, they used Seattle, Washington uh, as the base of their um, uh, time where they were in Alaska. What is important, though, is that in the wintertime, there is a period where there is no light. You are literally in darkness 24 hours of the day. And this stretches for a period of time. Now, could you imagine if you're living in Alaska or living in Canada or living in Norway and you don't have central heating and the cold is outside, it's darkness around you, people are dying from disease, it's a terrible time and, and every family would probably lose somebody or they would know of somebody dying from the cold and disease during that season. This is the winter solstice. And so when the sun starts to come out, the people now are looking at the sun as a life-giving force. And so during that time, a number of ceremonies were held in northern countries. In um, the far north was the Feast of the Twelve Nights, which stretched from December 25th to January 6th. Also in ancient Greece, there was the Bacchanalia, which was held for their god Bacchus, the god of wine and sport and play. The Romans had the Saturnalia for their god Saturn, their main sun god Saturn. And so you find during these times that the people held ceremonies in the north, they would burn uh, bonfires. The light was important, the fire, because the fire represents the light, the life-giving force for those who worship nature. Also in the north, they recognized that there was one tree that even that despite the cold would still remain alive. The evergreen, the, the evergreen tree, the fir tree. And so in some cases they would take this fir tree, believing that there was powers of life within the tree, and they would put it in their homes, set it there and put a light on the top of it, or burn them in the front, or they would make uh, 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 mistletoes and put them over their doorways, a type of what we would call ta'wiz or tamima. It is an amulet. And they would hang the amulet over their doors, hang the amulets in their home, hoping that this fir tree, that this so-called life-giving force would protect them from the danger of the winter. And so their ceremonies developed around this. And this went on for hundreds of years. We also find, in the ancient uh, northern countries, we find the Druids and the Druids of the north. And they carried out special ceremonies surrounding the mistletoe and surrounding the fir tree and the beliefs. And, and they would meet within circular areas. And they had a secretive cult that spread throughout the far northern countries. One of the interesting individuals, and you can look this up if you can find it in the dictionaries or encyclopedias, is a man called Mithra or Mithras. This is a very mysterious character. And when you look at history, you find that this uh, individual called Mithra was born on December 25th. His day of the week was the seventh day of the week that we still call Sunday. He was supposed to be the son of the, of the sun god himself, and they had a special sacrament made up of bread and wine, and they would make this drink during this time, and supposedly he died for the sins of the people. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But when you try to find Mitra or Mitras in the encyclopedias, they, through, through state intervention, erase the name. Why is this? That is because after the time of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, when his followers, uh, uh, when the message began to spread, and they went north, and you'll see within historical writings that Barnabas, one of his disciples, met a man named Saul, or Paul, who later called himself Paul. Paul said he saw Jesus on the Damascus road. And he went to the disciples, but the disciples turned against Paul. Only Barnabas stayed with him. But when Paul and Barnabas went into Greece, 
Barnabas left him. Now, what is the reason why they all left him? What are the concepts coming through Paul? Many people say, well, they left him because he was Saul before and he used to torture the, the early followers of, of Isa alayhi salam. But also you can see, and if you look at present day Christianity, that most of the concepts of the Trinity, of the blood sacrifice, the original sin, and most of the concepts uh, which relate to more than one God are coming through Paul. The preachers are, are, are quoting Paul sometimes more than Jesus during their sermons. And so Barnabas left Paul. And somewhere in the early days, in Rome or Greece, somewhere in that area, those missionaries who were teaching the, te the teachings of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, met with this force coming from the north. And so you will see in ancient Roman history that in, in some cases the Roman emperor would go out to the Colosseum and the gladiators would be fighting each other and everybody's cheering for the gladiators. Sounds like one of our football games. They would go to the Colosseum, right? And the gladiators would fight. And then if one of the gladiators was down, and they would look at the, at the emperor, should I kill him or not? And if he wanted to kill him, he would say, he would go like that, right? You know, that sign down. If he said, keep him alive, he goes like this. You know how we use it today? Yes, okay? He gives that sign, okay? One of the terrible things happening during these uh, rituals at the Colosseum is that they would bring the Christians out, literally men, women, and children, and feed them to hungry animals. They would take a hyena, or a wolf, or a lion, and get it hungry and crazy and beat it, and throw raw meat at it, and then send it out on the people. And they would literally cheer and watch as the animal ripped the bodies apart. This is a terrible culture. Tear the bodies apart. And so somewhere along the line, somebody who couldn't take the torture, who felt that maybe we can win these people over, made a compromise. And you start to see changes going on from the early part of the Christian era in Southern Europe, where the, the major ceremonies held by the nature worshiping people are combined with Christian names and Christian ceremonies and therefore what comes forth to us is a mixture with the two streams coming together where you get a monotheistic name or a monotheistic character with a pagan ceremony. And so the mixture of this together is what is giving us the present day hol holidays um, that we see. Number one, we understand that Isa alayhi salam, according to um, the different reports uh, of the different scholars in, in many religions, he was not born in the cold weather. History shows us that he was born during the warm weather. Even in, even in the Christian uh, traditions, they have the belief that the shepherds were tending their flocks outside. And in Palestine, you cannot keep your flocks outside in the wintertime in the evening. You bring them in because it's cool at night. And so it was the warm weather. It was also the time of the taxes in the north. In the story coming in the Quran, when we see the mention uh, in chapter 19 in verses 24 to 25, and we see the mention of the story of Mary, because it is the belief of the Muslims that Maryam, may Allah be pleased with her, was a virgin and she had dedicated her life to the worship of one God, prayer and fasting. And by the power of Allah that the Creator breathed His Spirit into her and she, she conceived Jesus, He said, be and it is, she conceived Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, without a father, without a man. That is the belief of Islam. It is also a, a belief that when she felt the pain of the pregnancy, that, that, that the angel came to her and told her to go outside of the city. She went outside of the city to a remote area and there she found a, a palm tree and she found water. And it was speaking about rutub, jannia. It was speaking about a type of rutub 
or a type of dates. And those who know, who have lived in the desert area know that when the dates um, become ripe, when you start to see the color of the dates change, because dates are not brown, you know. Dates are originally red and they're yellow, they're other colors, but they turn the brown. It's, it's at the height of the heat that the dates become ripe. And so it's at that time that she gave birth to Isa alayhi salam. So from different points of view, different historical points of view and different religions, we understand that Isa alayhi salam was not born during the winter season. He was born in the warm weather. So who was it that was born in the winter season? What is that, who is that character now? Let us become detectives and try to find out the answer to this problem. Number one, you have to understand this concept of Saturn, the concept of Bacchus. When they are portrayed by the different artists who drew pictures of them or the sculptures, they're usually portrayed as a heavy set man with a white beard. And when in the Sistine Chap Chapel, uh, Michelangelo drew his picture, you could see the long flowing beard and there are actually pictures of this man on a sled being drawn by snakes with wings. Snakes with wings. Snakes do not normally fly. But in this case, the snakes have wings and the heavy set man is on his sled being drawn by these flying animals. Sound familiar to you now, doesn't it? He's being drawn by the flying animals. He's performing miracles. He's, he's coming out on December 25th, which is not the birthday of Isa alayhi salam, has nothing to do with Christianity. It is the time of the, of the Bacchanalia and, and, and the Saturnalia. And he is representing riotous fun, drunken reverie. And so what happens on Christmas, the Christmas season, especially in America, people today are not even thinking about Isa alayhi salam. They're not even thinking about Jesus. They're looking how they can get drunk. On Christmas, what is going on? In the Caribbean and many parts, if they offer you a Christmas pudding or Christmas pie or Christmas drink, watch out. Because it's probably laced with rum or wine. That's the spirit of the season. Now this riotous occasion that was going on went so far that the Christian church banned it. And the Church of England, according to historical sources, actually banned it all the way to 1647. It was prohibited in England to celebrate Christmas because they saw Christmas as being a pagan holiday. This is an official position taken by the Christian church, the Church of England who were known at that time as Puritans. What happened was an individual was superimposed. A name was superimposed. We hear about the name of uh, Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas. Now, according to some historical reports, Saint Nicholas was a Christian bishop who lived in the fourth century in Asia Minor, which is now known as Turkey. He was a very thin man, very austere. He used to spend his time in prayer and fasting. And he loved children. And he spent his time dealing with children. And because of this now, his name, some believe, was imposed upon that day. And Saint Nicholas or Saint Nick comes into that position as being the main man of the day. There's another concept, which is even deeper than that. And that is that Saint Nicholas himself is actually coming from the ancient writings of Beowulf. And in these writings, which are done in the Scandinavian region, we find the name Nick or Nickel or Nicker. He was known as a demon, the demon of the north. He was known as the evil spirit of the north, the name of Odin, the evil principle. And so in Germany and in many of the northern countries, the people actually looked upon this so-called Saint Nick as being an evil force and they would tell their children in the winter time, don't go outside because if you do, Nicholas will come along, Nickel will come along, he'll capture you, put you in his bag and take you away. And so they used it as a negative concept, 
in Isaiah, in what is left of the Bible, in chapter four, in, in 14, 13, the devil is, is known as the prince of darkness. And it is an understanding that his throne, the seat of his power is in the north. Somewhere in the north is the seat of power of this evil. And so the Germans also, when they depicted this Nicholas or this uh, Pelsnickel, as they would say, Pelsnickel in German, it means a furry devil. When they, when they depicted him, they depicted him as a man with red fur. He had red fur coat. And he was, his base was in the north, and he was the essence of evil. And the, the Church of England, till 1647, took the position that this celebration could not go on. So what we are actually seeing is that the, 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 the Christmas occasion was actually the time of evil. It was the time of the belief in the Saturnalia and the Bacchanalia. And because of this, they shifted the occasion to New Year's Eve. They shifted all of their feelings and their merriment and their evil to New Year's Eve. Now before we go to that, looking back at, back at Christmas, what is happening now in Christmas season? I don't know what goes on in Miami. But in the northern cities, on Christmas occasion, they, they put lights around and Santa Claus parades. Do you have a Santa Claus parade here? They have Santa Claus parades and St. Nicholas is outside and he's in the streets and everybody's talking about St. Nicholas and the poor children are taught that St. Nicholas is gonna come down your chimney. Most people don't have chimneys in Miami anyway. But a 350 pound man is gonna come down your chimney and bring you presents and keep his clothes white and red and go to all of the homes in the area and, and put uh, um, uh, presents in your stockings and, and, and put uh, uh, presents under your tree and then fly back out into space. And, and the father, the poor father, who sweat and toiled all year to get you the presents gets no credit for the present given to the child. Saint Nicholas comes down the chimney, gives you this present, flies off into the night. And many of us were raised thinking, believing in this. Some of us would sneak into the night and look and see our father putting the present under the tree. We knew what he was doing anyway. But you went along with it and the people say, well, you know, it, it's Christmas. Don't you like to have fun? You want to stop the children from having fun? What kind of people are you? But what, is the, what are you teaching the children? You are using the name of Jesus using the name of Isa alayhi salam, and you are using a figure who historically is the devil. The devil himself, well, iyadu billah. They are using his figure, and he has now taken over the Christmas season. Christmas now to most people means materialism. You have to buy presents for your cousins and your friends, and you gotta buy about 34 uh, presents, and you find that most American people are in debt for six months after Christmas. Now, where is Jesus? You get drunk, you fight, you lose all your money, the stores raise their prices. Isa alayhi salam is described as a very humble person. Most of the time he didn't wear shoes, only one or two ch changes of clothing, a very simple person eating very simple food, fasting most of the time. You see what is going on? There are two streams now, a stream of polytheism, a stream of monotheism, and now the polytheism, the materialism, is overtaking the monotheism and standing in the way and taking over our society. And some foolish Muslims coming along from outside of in their country say, well, I just want to be an American. Um, I want a tree too. So I said, one of the brothers said he had a Christmas tree in his house. He came for, I said, brother, do you know what the tree stands for? He said, no, uh, okay, I'll get a palm tree with dates. I'll, I'll make it halal, a halal Christmas tree. But brother, you have to understand what it means. You have to understand what it means. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke about, he talked about a ruqya, wa tama'im, wa tiwala. He said, all of these things are shirk. That if you hang amulets, thinking that this ta'weez, or this amulet is gonna protect you from something, 
then you are actually giving power to, to, to the creation of Allah and taking it away from the Creator. If you think that by making some spells, going to a magician and asking them to put a spell on someone, you want to get married. So you go to the Sahir and say, put a spell on Ali, I want to marry him. Put a spell on Zainab. What kind of marriage are you going to have if you go to the magician? And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, named all of these things, the superstitions, the amulets, all of these type of things are the other stream which goes away from monotheism, from the belief in one God, and takes you into another religion. And so when the Church of England imposed this harsh penalty upon people who practice Christmas, they moved it to New Year's Eve. Now New Year's Eve historically in the North was known as Hogmanay. Originally the New Year for the Romans was March 1st. That was the New Year, not January 1st. So all of you who are on January 1st, where was I on January 1st? You're waiting for the light to go up in uh, uh, Times Square. The reality is, the Romans, for the Romans, March 1st was the beginning of the year. And, and, and when you look at the number 7 in Latin, you find Septem. So September was the 7th month, October, November, December, and, and so you find that the Latin words for these last uh, months, October, November, December, 8, 9, and 10. So these weren't the last months of the year. It was 8, 9, and 10. And so what actually happened was, when they imposed the new year on January, it is for the ancient uh, god, or their so-called god called Janus, the two-faced god, two faces who shows you one face, and behind it is another face. The master hypocrite. And so this is what is going on at this occasion. And we find now that on January 1st, right on that evening, December 31st, when it changes, you find you know, people are usually drinking, they're involved in some sexual activity at that time. The whole concept of Jesus and monotheism is lost. It is the other religion. What is also interesting for us to remember is that after January, in February, that somewhere around the middle of February, there was a, ce uh, there was a celebration that was known in, by the ancient Romans as the Lupercalia. And the Lupercalia was a, a ceremony, and Luper means wolf. And they depicted a wolf chasing a little girl. And so they had a ceremony. I'm not making this up, by the way, right? If you want to, you can look this up. If you don't believe me, go to the encyclopedia right after we're finished. A children's encyclopedia. Look up Valentine's Day, Easter, Christmas, and Halloween, and you'll find everything I'm talking about, okay? You want to go deeper into it, go on the internet. Okay, and look up the pagan roots of all of these holidays. And so the, Luperca the Lupercalia, was the celebration of the wolf. And the authorities there would gather together young people and they would put their names into a box, men and women, and they would take out the names and whoever was your partner, whoever you, you picked, whatever name you picked was your partner for the day and all types of sexual activity went on during that day. They were totally out of control. That is the Lupercalia. That's what it really means, okay? Now, around February 14th, Around 270 AD of the Christian era, a bishop by the name of Valentine, he was trying to work with the Roman soldiers because the Roman emperor um, had imposed upon his soldiers that anybody who joined the army could not get married. Because if you got married, you're thinking about your wife all the time, and you're a useless soldier. But the soldiers wanted to get married, so Saint Valentine worked with them, and he was captured by the Roman Emperor, he was imprisoned, and he was beheaded. And so a legend formed around St. Valentine's Day. In one case, it said he even helped a blind young girl. He was trying to help her get married. And so she wrote a note, and it was found in his jail cell, to my Valentine. And so from that date, somebody making that compromise brought together the two streams and so now you have Valentine's Day. 
So on that occasion, and it's in the, the school system, if, if, if Muslims are sending their children to school, you got a problem on Valentine's Day. Because they make them do Valentine's cards. In some cases, it becomes mandatory in some classes. Now they even have in Canada, I don't know about here, you can buy a Valentine's Day card. Somebody will come and sing, or somebody will bring food, and you know, they make it very lavish. And so what happens is young people are forced together on that occasion. And for those who are part of the monotheistic tradition, who understand that, that the relationship between men and women should be done in a sacred way within marriage and not in a loose way before marriage. And we see what is happening in the society itself. We see what has happened to the standards, even in, in the White House. So we understand what is going on in the society. That's because people have lost their limits, the hudud. The limits have been broken up. And so those who are maintaining the limits in the monotheistic religions, and in those people of consciousness, recognize that St. Valentine's Day is really part of a pagan holiday where people are carrying out the so-called wishes of Venus or Aphrodite, their little son called Cupid. And he shoots you with an arrow. You know that story? He shoots you with an arrow and you fall hopelessly in love. And some Muslims say, I want to get married, I'm in love. You're in love, what is love, man? There is kafa'a. In fiqh there is kafa'a, suitability. Yes, there should be an attraction between husband and wife. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, spoke about the, 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 the beauty, about wealth, about genealogy, right, Nasab, And about deen. And he said, marry people for their religion, for their deen, their taqwa. That is the basis of the marriage. And so, St. Valentine's Day is another time that we have to take a stand. And we can ha we will have a question and answer period at the end, but the position we are taking is the young people should have nothing to do with Valentine's Day. You have to step out of that completely. In Christmas, another problem faces us. What do you do? Do you give presents? Do you take presents? What do you do? Are you involved? One of the, one of the, one of the greatest benefits after my be belief in Allah, in, in accepting Islam, was when Christmas season came, and as a Muslim, we don't give any gifts. And Christmas even came, we said, Alhamdulillah. At that time, we have another way of, of, of expressing ourselves uh, during that season. And so Muslims should not be involved. In some cases, if the person is your neighbor or somebody and they give you a gift, the Prophet, peace be upon him, accepted gifts. So it is possible to, an accept, uh, to accept a gift as long as you're not involved in the ritualistic uh, parts of the occasion. But if you want to give a gift, give it at another time during the year. So they understand that we have other things. We have our Eid. We have other times. Let them invite them for food during the Eid al-Adha. Give them something at that time. Give sadaqah at different points in time. Now as we go toward the spring season now, we're following their calendar. We find that the spring solstice season comes about. Now this is another very powerful season. In this time, the darkness and the cold are leaving. And now the spring is coming, light has returned. It is the resurrection of life after death. And so with the light and the water and the rain, life then becomes, and, and those trees and plants, in, in Canada we lose all of our trees and plants in the winter, you probably don't. Uh, down here in this region. But up in the north, all the trees are, uh, lose their leaves except for the evergreen. And so in that spring season, the spring solstice, in the northern countries, a fertility celebration came about. And the main figure in that fertility celebration was their goddess Ostre or Ostern. And according to them, she waved her wand and life came back after death. And so the symbols of that occasion became rabbits, bunny rabbits, chickens, eggs. You take two rabbits and put them in the backyard and after a couple of days, there's rabbits jumping around everywhere in the back. It's a fertility symbol. And so therefore, this became the symbol. Now, the compromise. The Christians coming in now who want to get benefit from the nature worshiping people, they use that saying, if you can't beat them, 
join them. So they came along and they joined them. And so now you find Easter. Look at it. This is supposed to be the time of the death and resurrection of Isa alayhi salam. But it is the pagan rite of the resurrection of, de of, of life after death. And so they imp impose this occasion onto the spring season. And you find then both of these celebrations going, coming about at one time. The reality is, and the, the Muslims understand from the, the revelation of the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ They did not kill him, and they did not crucify him, Jesus. But it was made to appear to them that they did. And so they carried out the celebration. What happens now, is that people are involved in a series of rituals around an occasion which never actually came about. People are in shock sometimes. If you go ask the, 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 the regular American or Christian person, what does Easter mean? And they say, well, Easter is the time of, of, of the resurrection of Jesus. Resurrection from the dead. They don't realize where it actually comes from. The reality is it is a pagan rite. And it is based upon that concept of looking at the sun as the main uh, aspect of life because the sun again plays a powerful role during that season. In Europe also, uh, during that week, you had Palm Sunday, Ash Wednesday, Good Thursday, Good Friday. There's a number of occasions you can look them up and find them. On Good Thursday, you find many of the people, what they did is in the north, they wouldn't bathe all winter. And so when the spring came, they said, now you've got to take a bath. So you take a bath, they literally would go into the stream and take a bath, peel off their clothes, and then put on new clothes for Easter Sunday. And so many people you now see wearing their Easter bonnet and wearing their Easter suit and putting on their new clothes, but it is actually a cultural tradition based upon people coming from a terrible cold season where they were even afraid to take a bath because of pneumonia and other, other uh, sicknesses that would hit people who did not have central heating. And so it flows, it continues to flow, and we begin to understand now that there are actually two streams. Now going to the fall season, the Celtic people of the north used to believe that during the fall season their year began. And actually for the Celtics, their New Year's was November 1st. October 31st was the final day of the year for the Celtic people of the North. And that day was called the Day of Samhain. And this individual, well, Iyadu Billah, was supposed to be the, 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 their god of, of, of the spirits of the dead, of evil again. And according to their belief, the evil spirits would rise to the surface and would terrorize people on that evening. And on that evening, if you did something wrong to a person, they'd come back to get you on that night. So some people would put on a disguise so you couldn't recognize them on October 31st, on that evening, and then they would be safe. Also, they would burn fires. Now the only thing we find left of that is the jack-o'-lantern that they were put inside of their window, window made from the pumpkin. What actually happened in Europe is that the church moved All Saints Day, a day for the saints. They moved it from May 13th to November 1st in 1834 AD. And so what they said was that the 31st night is All Hallows Evening. All Hallows Evening, which in America later became known as Halloween. Halloween. And they depict the forces of evil. What is happening now is that the children put on disguises. They dress as little devils, little witches as goblins, vampires, anything evil, and they go out. And now with the new American way, they do trick or treat. And they come to your house asking for food. Do they do that here in Miami? trick or treat. They knock on your door in the disguise. And some Muslims, thinking they, they want to be Americans, or they want to be Canadians, they send their little children 
um, and they're in the little disguises. So what are you going to dress them as, a little angel? What are you going to be? How are you going to dress and go out there? And so the reality that we recognize is that number one, this is the day of Samhain. And the Quran tells us, inna shaitan al insani aduun mubin, that the devil is an open enemy to humanity. There is no compromise with the devil. And so we don't play around and disguise ourselves as little devils, little shayateen. We do not disguise ourselves as this, because it is an open enemy to the people of monotheism. Also, there are a number of other aspects. What is happening now, as you may know in America, is that there is a new church coming about which is called the Church of Satan. Well, iyadu billah. And in the 60s in San Francisco, the church um, was initiated. And right now in the American army, if you are Jewish and you die, they bring you a rabbi. If you're Muslim, they'll bring you an imam. If you're Christian, they'll bring you a priest or a minister. If you're registered as part of the Church of Satan, they bring you a priest from the Church of Satan. And he is performing these rites and rituals, calling on the devil to accept his initiate. And so this is growing in this society. And they actually did a couple movies. They did this Rosemary's Baby. All right? they, they also, uh, The Exorcist. And a number of movies they did to frighten people with evil. That you will be so afraid of evil, and they show the priests as bumbling idiots falling down over their feet, can't do anything, running away from the devil. And the devil is a businessman in his suits. And he has the power of lightning and everything. So even though the devil dies in the end, you end up being more afraid of the devil than anything else. That's part of the plot, to brainwash people to be afraid of the shaitan. The reality is, is that the Prophet said um, uh, that, that the, the upper hand is better than the lower hand. Al yad al uliya khayrun min al yad al sufla. That the upper hand is better than the lower hand. What that means is you should be the one who gives and don't beg. That we should not be begging. And so to send a Muslim child out to trick or treat is a demeaning, lowering thing. You ask them to beg people for food. Then they're dressed up in a, in, 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 as a way that they're not. Then when the candies and, and things come in the bag, how do you know what it is they actually gave you? Is it halal? Most of the candies today are made with gelatin, with glycerin. They're made with pork products. We had one person in our area, in the Boston area where I grew up, one person in our area, in our project, he, he, he used to sit back and he used to give everybody X-lax. You know X-lax? He would give you chocolate and he puts X-lax in the thing. And then he goes around and waits the next day to see everybody. <laughs> so they can do anything to you, man. You have no control over the situation. You have no control. And what is also happening is that there are some evil, wicked-minded people who are attacking children on that night. I don't know about Miami, but in Canada now, they openly say on the television, do not send your children trick-or-treating by themselves. Do not go to in darkened streets. Move as a group. Don't go to a house that you don't know the people on the inside. And there are literally groups of Satanists who are capturing children and they're performing a rite, sacrificing the child on that evening of Samhain, supposedly to get more spiritual power. It's happening right now. And so from so many angles, Muslims should have nothing to do with Halloween. And if your children are in school, Go to the teacher. Go to the teacher and make it clear to the teacher we do not involve our children in these ceremonies. Even the Jehovah's Witnesses will go to the teacher and tell them, take my child out of Halloween. They don't even believe in that. Take my child even out of your Christmas. They're not involved in that. What can happen during these occasions, if you want them to draw pictures of pumpkins or you know, fall plants, okay. But we don't want to be involved in these confused rituals that, that are giving signals from many different angles. And so, in conclusion, we recognize the fact that the, the present system of rituals and holidays in this country 
and in the Western countries is a confused hodgepodge of cultural rituals. And it is important for Muslims to have basira, that they should have the insight to look through affairs and do not just blindly follow the ways of the Christians and the Jews. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you will follow them. You will follow the people who came before you inch by inch, foot by foot. Even if they crawl into the hole of a lizard, you crawl inside there with them. And then they said, who are these people? Are they the Christians and the Jews? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, who else? And so it has come to pass. And you can't Islamicize these occasions. You can't use Arabic names and Islamic symbols to make it halal. We have to take a stand. And secondly, it is important for Muslims to cherish their own holidays. When the Eid al-Fitr comes, take the day off. There are some Muslims who go to work on Eid. They go to Eid prayer and they go to work. So what happens to your children? They don't have a chance to, to, to relax and enjoy themselves. Organize an activity. Bring the families together. Eat together. Do things together. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. Make it a happy occasion for them. They will remember their Eids. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha. If they don't, then they get involved in Christmas, in Easter, in Halloween, where even in the Christian tradition now, it is confusing. And many of the Christians now, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and many people are taking a stand. And they're saying, we do not want to follow the pagan religion. So what about those who have been blessed with monotheism? And so I want to leave you with these words. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would help the younger generation to be able to take a stand, especially for the Muslims to take a stand and for those non-Muslims to try to understand what Islam really is. To try to understand that our society, that we, what we are living in in our society, our moral standards are being lowered to the point where if people of conscience do not take a stand, then we will be living in a state of confusion. In Canada, common law marriages are practiced more than regular marriages. In Quebec, in the French province of Canada, it has the highest, second highest rate of common law marriages on earth is in Quebec. And they say these marriages only last at the most five years. So if the families are broken apart, if children are being molested, if women have no um, sanctuary or protection in the society, even in the White House, if nowhere is safe, then the basis, the essence of the society itself is become rotten. And this will influence the economic situation, the political situation, all aspects of life. So I leave you with the, with the thought that people of conscience should uh, take uh, time, study history, Go back to the source of the religions, and you'll find that all of the religions are based in Tawheed, in the oneness of God. It will take you right back to the source. And when you think about a Muslim now, realize it's not somebody who's thinking about blowing up the Empire State Building. That's stereotyping, that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. Islam is based on peace, submission to the Creator. When we meet each other, we say, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be upon you. And we pray for peace for all people. That's a Hollywood fantasy. And we only hope that they would leave us alone and start chasing the aliens who they believe are their real enemies and leave our community alone, deal with the aliens, okay? And let us live as human beings together um, in peace and in harmony. I leave you with this. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Okay, concerning uh, the questions, uh, one goes as follows: When you said Isa alayhi salam or Jesus was born in the warm weather, could that be warm weather in Jerusalem, but winter time and cold weather in the northern western countries? Please clarify. No, that would, that that is uh, warm weather everywhere because in in Jeru in Palestine itself it, it is it is cold in the winter. Many people don't understand. That, that in many of the um, desert countries, it actually you know, gets cold. There's a change in, 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 in the season. So the people who are living in Palestine and those regions, they know the difference between the heat of the summer and the winter time. It's not cold like the north 
obviously here uh, in America. But, but there is a difference, and the historians um, you know, believe that it is, it, it, you know, all agree that it was the warm weather. Uh, sometime in the warm weather, that means the warm season, following the solar calendar, right? the warm season um, anywhere in the world. Also, the question concerning the holiday Thanksgiving. There's a number of questions about that. Um, it says, I don't agree with it. However, some of my Muslim relatives practice it. Comment, what about Thanksgiving? Well, th there is some discussion of the fact that the native people here in this part of the world um, did have some gathering that they had uh, at some point during that time. And in the northern countries, there's, um, uh, uh, during that season, it is the time when the, the, the plants are, are getting ripe and the, the harvest is there. And so people normally would take a time out and, and thank the Creator. They, they, would, they would have some sort of ritual during that time of Thanksgiving. For Muslims, we don't follow any particular ceremonies to actually be following the day as a ceremony itself. Because that would then put us into bid'ah. That would be an innovation. So we don't actually follow the ceremonies itself. Um, uh, however, you know, thanking the Creator, we, we, we do that, we try to do that um, every time you eat. You should make dua, you know, before that, and you should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for giving you the rizq or giving you the, the provisions of the food He has provided for you. Um, and, you know, the, to, 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 for the people who are carrying this ceremony out, um, if somebody attends and, and, and the family is just having food, it's not really a ritual. Somebody just comes over to eat food and see the family. There's nothing wrong with that. What we are against is being involved in the ritual things of giving gifts, to, uh, taking gifts, you know, the trees and whatever. Just coming, going over for a dinner itself, there's nothing really wrong um, uh, with, with, with the dinner itself. Uh, it says, during the Christmas season, or during Christmas, could you explain why the, the, the complementary colors of red and green are paired together? That's a very good question. Um, the green probably is standing for the life, evergreen. It's standing for the green of the plants themselves. The red, I know again, the image of Saint Nicholas himself in the German belief is that Saint Nicholas wore red. He had red clothing on. I'm not sure of the other concepts why they could use red, but the green normally does stand for the green of chlorophyll, of, of plant life. It stands for life itself. That's probably why they're using that. Another question is about Kwanzaa. This, this is a ceremony which is being held in the African-American community. And those who understand our community know this ceremony was actually um, uh, made by um, Dr. Kar Karinga, right? I don't want to say Maulana. I mean, I don't know how he got this name, Maulana. But anyhow, I mean, Dr. Karinga, Ron Karinga. And those of us who lived in the 60s know him as um, a pork chop nationalist, um, you know, who was involved in a form of nationalism and he had his organization. And um, those of us who were involved in the struggle, there were some funny things went on in California. Actually with Bunchy Carter, if you know what happened with the Panther Party, there was some funny stuff that went on during that time. So I mean, even to follow his leadership, even in the community itself, many people in the 60s would not follow the leadership of Ron Karinga. Secondly, Kwanzaa is just a thought. He just brought his thoughts together. And he said, well, we will, we will mix together, we will make the lights, and we, we, each day we will do a certain thing. And he just, you know, thought up some good principles. And, and he made a ceremony about it. So it's, it's not a religion, and, and, and it's nothing that we should even have to do, or feel that we have to do. Because it's not, it's not African either, by the way. There's no part of Africa they celebrate Kwanzaa. So it's only following uh, Ron Karinga. you know, when you're doing Kwanzaa. So as a Muslim, we definitely would not be involved in anything to do with Kwanzaa. And we, we, you know, we have better things to do, and we should give Ron Karinga dawah, and inshallah, he should accept Islam. Uh, it says, can you please explain the difference between uh, Sunday and the so-called Sabbath day, uh, Saturday? Well, th the Sabbath, you have to remember, Yom is Sabbath. This is something with the, with the children of Bani Israel. That it is the day Yom is Sabbath, you can look in Surah Al-Baqarah, that the second chapter of the Quran and in different places in the Quran where it speaks about Beni Israel and at the Yom Sabbath that they had to stop work during the day. They had to do, they had, they had to make their prayers, remember the Creator. And they were actually tested on, on the day of the, Seb, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, when Allah actually sent fish jumping all in the water and they weren't supposed to catch the fish. 
And so they use their, um, their, their mind and their guile in there. And so they put the nets out on Saturday and then, and then brought the nets in filled with fish on Sunday. But according to Quran, they would change into monkeys and pigs because of trying to play games on the Creator. And so, um, but still the reality is, we respect the fact that the followers of Moses, Musa alayhi salam, that this um, was a very important occasion. It is the day of Sabbath, the Sabbath. And um, you know, it had great spiritual meaning for the children of Israel. And um, there's a difference between that day, they were monotheists, the follow of, followers of Moses, Musa alayhi salam, are monotheistic people. And um, there's a difference between that day and Sunday. Sunday is the other stream, that's the poly polytheistic stream of the people who are worshiping the sun. So there's a difference now, of course, now in our hodgepodge type of culture, we bring everything together and you know, we're just American. Saturday, Sunday, Monday or Moon Day, uh, everything's all together now and it's secularized now so nobody cares about religion anyway. So I'm just thinking about going to work or getting off of work. Um, so the question surrounding Thanksgiving, working in a school of young children, as a Muslim is my duty not to guide these children in holiday activities like Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving, when it is part of the curriculum or when I feed children at lunch and the meal is pork. Now what do I do, deal, how do I deal with this? Okay, this is a very difficult situation because there are certain rules within the boards of education that you have to follow. But I think you know, in, in the Canadian Board of Education, I believe it's the same here in Miami, you, you can go to the rules of, of the Board of Education and you'll find that all of the, the constitutions of the boards protect the religion of the, all the people who are in the board. So as a Muslim, if there is something which goes against your religion, then you are not required to do that thing if it is against your religion. So the best thing to do would be to go to the Board of Education itself, speak to a higher official, and explain the situation that the handling of pork, things like that, is, not, is against your religion. They understand that because of kosher uh, type you know, concepts. And also explain about Halloween and whatnot, and that you don't want to be involved in those occasions. Do it in a, in, a, in a very sober, dignified way. And inshallah, I believe that they would, um, they would let you not be involved in that you know, because they, they're really realizing that this is against your religion. Um, Um, now, th there's another question here, uh, celebrating birthdays itself. Now, there's a number of discussions surrounding birthdays. I mean, it was, the birthdays were not celebrated in the, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. They were not celebrated. And actually, when you see the concept of the birthday with the candles and the light for each of the birthdays, that more than likely goes back to uh, pagan worship through the fire and the sun god. So therefore, it is not actually an Islamic practice uh, to be celebrating birthdays. And um, it, it, there's nothing wrong with knowing when your birthday is and things like that, but we don't have ritualistic practices. It's not within our tradition, really, to have them. Um, it says, um, there's a question here that says, what about the pagan roots of Muslim holidays, like the Hajj? Okay, this is a strange question. Um, and I don't know how much this, the questioner knows about the Hajj itself. But the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is the fifth pillar of the five pillars of Islam, is based upon the Prophet Abraham, the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who with uh, one of his wives, he was married to Sarah, and she could not have children, and he took his servant Haja or Hagar as a wife, and according to our traditions, um, the three of them went to Mecca, known as Becca, and they established the Kaaba, the house of worship. And so during that time when Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam, left Hajar in Mecca and went back to Sarah, who was in the north. And Hajar ran in between um, two mountains. She was searching for water. It's very hot. And so the, 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 the rituals, the monastical Hajj, the rituals of the Hajj are based upon the actual story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, what he went through. And also the temptation. He was tempted by the shaitan. The devil came to him. And so he stoned um, the shaitan. So all of the rituals during the Hajj itself are based upon monotheistic teachings. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who saw himself as the um, continuation of, of the message of Moses, of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, all of the prophets of monotheism, 
he confirmed what was brought and through revelation he uh, gave us the manasik al-hajj or the rituals of hajj which brought back to life the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and so Muslims come together with all of the people of the world and they recognize their relationship with Abraham, with Moses, with Jesus, with all of the prophets through that pilgrimage itself. The black stone, um, which um, you know, in some traditions uh, is said that it came from Jannah, this was put in, or paradise, it, it was put in by uh, uh, Ibrahim himself. And um, there is no worship of the stone itself. Um, even the, the, the Umar ibn Khattab, one of the Sahaba, said to the stone, because the Prophet Muhammad kissed the stone, or he, and he touched the stone, uh, as part of the, the circumambulation of the Kaaba. And, and, and Umar said, you know, you're only a stone. And it's only because I saw the Prophet, or I knew the Prophet peace be upon him did it, that I, would e that I would even do this. So there's no worship of the stone itself, and it is not based upon any pagan religions that came before. I think that's a misunderstanding. Also, there is a question about, you have some non-Muslim friends, and uh, you go out with them, but you're not doing anything haram. Is this okay? Um, we have um, associates, um, and we have um, people who are very close to us. And when the Quran is speaking about awliya, la tattakhid al yahuda wa nasara awliya, ba'duhum awliya ubad, that do not take um, the, the Christians or the Jews, people who believe, you know, other religions, as your awliya. That means your close friends, somebody who you would tell your secrets to, or, or so, because there, there is some difference in our understanding. Because through culture, through people, um, the prophets, some of the prophets were not accepted by other believers in their religions. Islam itself ac accepts Moses, accepts Jesus and Mary, and also accepts Muhammad, may Allah be, uh, be pleased with them all and send peace to them all. They're all accepted as prophets of God, and that they are, and Mary as being a, a righteous woman. And you know, that they are accepted in the way of their traditions, not as um, idols or not as um, gods to be worshipped. So therefore, because of this crucial difference in belief, we have, uh, we have association. Um, but when it comes to certain aspects that deals down with the essence of religion, the Quran tells us that you should um, you know, have this close allegiance, your allegiance. Um, al wala wal bara that this allegiance should be uh, for those who are following um, a, a similar way of life. One of the great blessings that we are um, uh, experiencing here in America is the fact that we are able to rub shoulders with people of different religions and different traditions. And that is good, that is fine. But it's important to understand that it is not part of American culture, or it's not supposed to be part of the culture, that you melt down your culture and you become something else. This is not the essence of being an American or a Canadian. What it means is that there are certain laws, you respect the rights of individuals in the society. You do not harm them. You live as a civil person in society. But everybody is allowed to have their religious beliefs and to cherish their beliefs. And nobody's religion should be stereotyped. Everybody has this right, or we're supposed to have this right within this society. If you don't have the right, then something's wrong. So we um, uh, cherish this aspect. However, um, when stereotyping comes in, then name calling starts and, and, and prejudice begins. That is prejudgment, where you see a person and based on their clothing and based on their language, you would judge them. I hope to, that, that from tonight, that we can all um, take these few words only as the opening of a door, that we all need to do some research. And we all need to try to understand concepts and beliefs, our religions, holidays, everything that we're doing from the source. Understand where it is. And don't be fooled by a television commercial, by bright lights. Don't be fooled by Santa Claus smiling at you. Don't be fooled by any of those images that are propagated in beautiful ways. Let us go to the roots of the issue and deal with the truth. I leave you with these words. And I ask Allah to give you a safe journey home. And may Allah uh, forgive me for any mistakes that I have made. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruku wa natubu ilayk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal as inna al insana lafi khus. 
إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وصلى الله تعالى سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته